Hello class, welcome to this week's lecture, uh, basically on chapter 19, but we're going to focus on a few themes within the chapter. So I wanted to look specifically at the Northern Renaissance style that's cultivated. Um, so we'll look at a few specific works, we'll look at van der Weyden's Deposition, and then we'll turn to Jan van Eyck's Double Portrait. And then finally we'll actually look at some illuminated manuscripts, we'll look specifically at um, um, the Lindbergh brothers, there's three brothers who are working, who were miniature artists, who are working on um, the, the very rich Book of Hours, and we'll look at that at the end of today's lecture. But I wanted to start by looking at a quick map. So here we're in the northern, uh, we're in just north of France, and in the northern, uh, right north of France and Germany. So we're looking here at modern day Belgium, um, especially, and we're going to look specifically at Flanders. So we'll look a lot at Flemish uh, artists. And here we have Flanders. Um, so we have modern day uh, Belgium, and then we have the Netherlands up here as well, and Holland. So during the northern Renaissance, we have artists who are really interested in closely observing and detailing nature accurately through art, and this becomes very popular, especially within Renaissance movements. So the concept of the individual and individual's personalities also rose to prominence, and this is something that's very specific to uh, the Renaissance culture, not only in the north, but also uh, south in France and in Italy as well. So more artists began to sign their works. This also meant that many artists became well known and artists were becoming more patronized. That is to say that um, there became um, a, a movement towards huge art patrons. So there was a lot of money that was put into the arts and um, many people would commission art. Um, done by specific artists who uh, were famous at this time. And before this, we really didn't have artists gaining fame for their work. Um, so this is a big thing that also happens in the uh, Renaissance period in the 15th century, um, not only in the North, but also uh, very prominently, especially in Italy and France. And we also see this um, to an extent in, um, in Spain and other parts of Western Europe, including Germany as well. So there was a new power uh, of Flanders. So this is that Flemish area that we just talked about, um, and more broadly in the greater Netherlands. And so these artists began to challenge traditions, especially traditions associated with the church. So this is something that we also see happening more broadly um, within a movement called humanism. And this is a very uh, Renaissance kind of movement, and it's a movement towards the individual. Interested uh, artists and scholars, philosophers, becoming interested in uh, people, right? Not just in gods, but in the people themselves and in the individual. As we said here, we have artists becoming individual personalities. And so this is something that we see as a move away from the church, uh, and when I say that, I say, uh, I mean that um, prior to this, um, basically, there was a, an interest in, um, in um, holy figures, right, as being uh, more godly, more important than, you know, the humble individual. But during the Renaissance period, we see an interest in humans. So this is the movement we call humanism, as I said, where we have artists who are interested in the human body and the human mind, um, and these things become more prominent. Um, so there's a slight switch, uh, shift away from the church in some, in some senses. In terms of style, uh, we see kind of a, um, the international Gothic style, which was cultivated in the late 14th century, um, influencing Northern artists during the Renaissance as well but we'll see how these artists move away from that style. But here, just to give you an example of that international style that did prevail, we have the Annunciation from Simone um, Martini, who is a prominent 
uh, Italian artist who was working um, at the time. Um, and his style was, uh, it's very, his works are very um, um, specifically informed by this international Gothic style. So how do we see this? Well, here we see the emphasizing of decorative patterns. You also, I mean, you see the decorative patterns not only in the clothing, so I've just zoomed in a little bit here. You see these elaborate clothing uh, choices here, but also in the trees, in natural forms. So look at this little plant here, where we have this amazing decorative style that's used um, in the leaves that she's holding and the plant between the two figures. And of course, this is the Annunciation. So we have um, the Virgin Mary here finding out that she will bear a child. Um, so we have text coming from the angel's mouth um, that signifies, you know, that she will, is the chosen one and that she will um, um, become um, uh, become pregnant with, uh, with the, the Christ child soon. And so here we have this beautiful um, decorative patterns, decorative stylizations um, of uh, the figures, not only the figures and the drapery that we see them wearing, but also of the natural forms, including those plants and the throne itself, so the architecture as well of the building. We also see um, very often within this Gothic style, this international Gothic style, we see the use of gold leaf. Um, so you can see the whole background is gold, and this is very common in that Gothic style, um, where we see an ambiguous space, so we don't really know where these figures are, um, but rather the whole entire space is rendered in this flat gold. And here we have the use of gold leaf, which is basically artists painting gold onto the canvas. Um, and that's very typical of this style. Figures are always elong elongated and very elegant, so they're not necessarily the most realistic figures, but they're very elegant through the elongation of the form of, form of the body. And as I said before, we've got an intense interest in detailing. And then um, if you were in this class last semester, um, right at the end you might have touched on the Gothic style itself by looking at some architecture uh, in the Gothic style where you see pinnacles, you know, pointed arches that you see here, um, very classical, um, uh, classically gothic styles that you see here. And this does transfer over into the work that we're going to be looking at, but we'll see how things are a little different as well. So I wanted to start by looking at Jan van Eyck, um, a Flemish painter who was working and who became kind of one of the masters of Northern Renaissance art. So here we have a double portrait um, of Giovanni Arnolfini, the figure here, and his wife, presumably, who we see here. Now the thing about this painting is that there's the scholarship has changed and changed and changed over time. And so then uh, when I was actually in college years ago, um, this was taught as a wedding portrait. So this was actually taught in classes and in textbooks as the Arnolfini uh, wedding portrait. But since then, now it's kind of just seen as a double portrait of a married couple, a couple that's already married. So it's also been, uh, scholars have also talked about this in terms of perhaps being a memorial um, to, um, to this woman here. Um, Scholars have talked about her as deceased, and this is a memorial to her uh, for a variety of reasons. But really, um, for the sake of um, looking to your textbook, and we can actually talk about this as a double portrait of a man and wife. So we do know some things about this for sure. We do know that Arnolfini himself was an Italian merchant who was living in Bruges in Belgium. He was very wealthy, as you can see here, we've got symbols of wealth everywhere. And that brings me to uh, one key term that comes up this week, and a, t a key term that will come up throughout the, uh, the uh, many weeks in this course, and that term is symbolism. And this will come up this week in your discussions as well, or perhaps in one of your, uh, your quiz. Um, but basically, what is symbolism? Well, symbolism is basically the use of um, um, and every, it could be any everyday object that symbolizes something else. So, for instance, 
here we've got a variety of symbolism. So many objects within here symbolize wealth. For instance, we have the clothes that the figures are wearing, this really dense kind of drapery, which would have been very expensive. So even though these are just um, articles of clothing, they also symbolize the wealth of the pa uh, the wealth of, wealth of the people who commissioned this, right? Um, Arnolfini himself. Um, we also have the use of, of furnishings here. Look at all the, this a beautiful, uh, this red bed that is um, um, behind the couple. It has beautiful red drapery, um, thick linens. Now this would certainly signify wealth of the couple. They have this amazingly beautiful chandelier at center, a uh, clock that we'll get in, or I'm sorry, not a clock, a mirror at center, which we'll get into in just a second. But all sorts of symbols of wealth we see throughout the painting. Another way that we see symbolism um, is in the fact that the couple's shoes are removed. So here you see I'm circling um, um, one pair of shoes in the back and then one pair of shoes in the front. So both um, both of these figures have removed their shoes, and this might be symbolic that there's a sacred event taking place. So this is common um, that we see um, within a variety of religions that when people are asked to take off their shoes, it is because there's um, some sort of sacred ground that is not to be stepped on with shoes, and so perhaps that might be a symbol of something more broadly that's happening here, something that might be somewhat sacred. But again, we don't know. This is just a speculation. Another symbol, a uh, form of symbolism here in the painting is this single candle that we see up here in the chandelier. There's one single candle that's lit, and sometimes that can uh, symbolize the presence of God, okay? So that might be another thing. Um, I'm sorry, there's actually, yes, one candle here. Um, and so that might be, be signifying the presence of God. So again, thinking about the sacred, the possibility that there is a sacred event happening here. Um, this is mimicked by prayer beads in the background between the couple. Another possibility um, of symbolism of the sacred in, within the space. However, this painting has also been I talked about in terms of pregnancy. In fact, when I was studying this in school many years ago, that was the main kind of event of the portrait was, okay, this is a, a couple, uh, as a wedding portrait, and she holds up um, her skirt, and you can see here that she must obviously be pregnant, right? She's bearing child because of the bulging of her stomach here. Um, and the other thing that signifies that is if we look right behind her, um, we have a figure this is, uh, if you look very closely, and I think I have a quick zoom up here, yes. So if you look closely uh, um, behind her, right here, you can see that we have the representation of the patron saint, um, Daisy, of childbirth. And so scholars have also speculated that perhaps she's bearing child because we have not only the thick uh, thickness of the fabric here, around her abdomen, but also because we have the rendering of the patron saint of childbirth that she might be actually pregnant within the piece. So that's just kind of a little bit of symbolism. Um, another symbol that we often um, talk about in terms of this painting is the dog itself. The dog can be seen as a symbol of wealth because this was a, a breed that would have been very expensive, kind of a toy, you know, one of those toy breeds. Um, this isn't a dog that is, uh, has any physical function, right, in some ways. It's not a dog that's going to help you in the field, but rather this is a lap dog that one might have just to um, signify their wealth. But the other way that we often saw, have seen uh, dogs um, um, used in paintings at this time is that dogs were also a symbol of fidelity and loyalty. So here that might be another symbol of um, the relationship between the two figures as being loyal to one another and um, a symbol of fidelity. So that's another possibility that we see here. The other thing that I wanted to bring up, if we look between the two figures, is that there's this amazing detailed mirror that we see at center. And if we look very, very closely, 
we can actually see that it shows that there are witnesses to this event. There are two people that we see here who have entered into the space. So we see the backs of our two figures, Arnolfini and his wife, and then we actually see the artist himself and another figure who are witnessing something in the space. And that's because we have a kind of a, a mirror here that shows an expansion of the space. And then around the mirror, we actually have these very detailed, tiny little um, um, images, which are actually um, representations of the Christ, the passion of the Christ. So here again, we have that religion, that sacred space is somewhat implied in the mirror. The other important thing to note is the inscription right above the mirror. So this is actually an inscription by the artist that says Johannes uh, Jan van Eyck was here. And so here we have the artist actually signing his work by saying, I'm here. And then right below the signature, um, in this proclamation of the artist's presence, we also have a tiny little portrait of the artist himself as witness to the space. So all of these things, you know, are, are symbolic in some ways, um, but they're also still very vague. And we still don't quite know why um, the artist chose to include himself, why he chose to sign the piece in such a specific way by saying he was there. Um, we just don't know. Another thing I wanted to mention, uh, as if you look here, um, over to this, right behind uh, the figure on the left, is we have some oranges. And so oranges are another um, symbolic, uh, um, something very symbolic within the piece. So here we have oranges at this time were very expensive, so they could possibly just be symbolic of another symbol of wealth in the painting, or they could be a reference to the original sin. So they could be a reference to the original Garden of Eden um, and to our innocence, right, before Adam and Eve um, um, issued in uh, the era of sin by eating the, the sacred apple, okay? So there's all sorts of things happening here, but in terms of style, we also have to talk about the fact that this is very classically Northern Renaissance. And so uh, one of the... Um, Power, one of the videos that I put up for you this week is on oil paint and how people would make oil paint. So Northern uh, Renaissance artists were absolutely innovative in their creation and use of oil paint. So they were able to have these very, uh, very kind of thin layers um, that they would actually thin out with different types of oil um, and dip, different types of water, uh, different types of oil, I guess. I'm not trying to say, and they'd also use water in that process to thin out their paint so they could put layers and layers and layers um, on each painting, allowing the light to enter the space very subtly. Um, and they perfected this technique, and this is what we call luminosity. So within the figures, we even see kind of super kind of um, thin layering that actually allows light to enter into the piece through these layers um, in a very specific and a very a beautiful way. So artists were very interested in um, this kind of luminosity, but also very interested in very vivid, bright colors, this is something we see often in the north. Um, and that's all I wanted to uh, talk about with this piece. There's so much written about it, so if you're interested, you can look much more into the symbolism, but here you have a piece that's absolutely wrought with symbolism, and we still don't quite know why everything is the way it is in this painting. The other painting I wanted to look at within the Northern style is by uh, Roger van der Weyden. This is the deposition. So basically, um, if, you know, if you know a bit about um, the Bible or the biblical scenes, you know the deposition is actually the scene in which Christ is removed from the cross. This is a quite large piece. It's about seven by eight and a half feet. Um, so it's, it, these figures would be life size. And here again, we have an interest in humanism, but I would um, say even more so than we've seen in other examples. The artist himself was very interested in the individual and in emotions specifically. And if we look closely, here we have Christ at center. 
And then we have um, the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, right um, below him. And if we look closely, we can see the tears in the eyes of all of the figures who are present. So I've just zoomed into this fellow, um, this woman here, and then the Virgin Mary. And as we can see, they've got these amazingly detailed renderings of tears falling from their eyes as they witness Christ being taken down from the cross. So this signifies a real interest in individuality, but also in emotion. The artist was interested in uh, viewing Christ and holy figures as humans, right? This is an interest in humanism. So an interest in making um, holy figures uh, of the church, bringing them down to the level of the rest of us. Um, we experience pain, we experience suffering and sadness, and here the artist is saying, well, so do these figures. So this is something that's very specific. We can, emphasize, we can uh, empathize with these figures as we, look, uh, as we look at them. But then even more broadly, we still have a, a total emphasis on that northern Flemish kind of style. So we have again the heavy drapery, same as we saw with Jan van Eyck's piece. We have an interest in the vivid color, the luminosity, right, the light, and the way that the light actually is caught even within each one of the singular tears that drop down everyone's faces. We have the elongation of figures, very typical of Northern style. We have gold used again, even going back to that Gothic international style, we have that ambiguous golden uh, background where you see the use of gold leaf painted into the, onto the painting. Um, and we also have that, that intense uh, attention to detail. The other thing that I wanted to mention here, once again, is symbolism. And so here again, we have symbolism. It's very common within this period. Symbolism uh, that connects the mother, uh, that emphasizes and connects uh, the mother and son relationship between um, Christ and Mary. So they're connected not only through their pose, right? They both are similarly posed as falling. Mary has fainted. Um, because she's just uh, so overwhelmed emotionally by um, Christ being taken down from the cross. So her pose mimics his pose, um, but also they're um, mimicked and connected to one another in that the same way that she faints and will again regain her consciousness, you know, we know when people faint, uh, they regain consciousness over time, Christ too will regain consciousness, right? He's died on the cross, but then we know the Bible tells us that there is a re resurrection, and so that he too will rise again, just like his mother will rise again. So there's the symbolism there between the two figures. The last piece of symbolism that I want to suggest is uh, the skull that we see down here. Oftentimes a skull in a painting like this would be a signifier of death or mortality, um, um, an icon which draws our attention to how short life can be. However, here we also know that it has much to do with Adam um, as um, Adam and Eve, well not Adam and Eve, but just Adam specifically, because um, there, are all, there are also stories that um, Adam, uh, the, the space that Christ was crucified, uh, the place that he was crucified at, was also where Adam was buried. And so anytime we see um, um, any bones or specifically a skull at the base of uh, the crucifixion scene, we know that there's actually a link to Adam who caused the fall into original sin, right? Adam and Eve caused the fall into original sin. And then we, here we have Christ and Mary saving us from original sin. So that might be the suggestion here that is symbolized by um, the use of the bone that you see here, and then also the skull itself. So again, these artists are really interested in symbolism, things that we wouldn't necessarily um, catch right away, but we have to look closely at these things, and then we begin to see the symbolic meaning. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to uh, talk about today is um, 
uh, the Book of Hours. Okay, and so here I, I wanted to look quickly at illuminated manuscripts. So wealthy patrons at this time treasured volumes of secular, secular writing as well as religious texts. Only the most lavish books would have full page miniature paintings on them set within frames, as you see here. This is actually the Book of Hours we're about to look at. Um, they were conceived as windows looking out into the landscape. There were three brothers who were also um, living in Northern Europe at the time, the Limburg brothers, um, who were famous for their minor miniatures. They were painters who were specifically interested in these tiny paintings we call miniatures. And here we have their Book of Hours that we're going to look at in just a second. A Book of Hours was a popular book to own at the time. Many patrons wanted the Book of Hours. Um, it would be a book that would be a prayer book. And it would set forth different times to pray, different times of day, and at different seasons throughout the calendar. So it was basically for personal and devotional use. So if we look specifically here at this book, uh, Book of Hours, which was actually created for, um, for an important duke at the time, the Duke of Berry, but we'll get there in just a second. Um, we can see what's happening here um, that at the top of each page, and we'll get there in just a second, but the two pages we're going to look at that are the two pages that are in your book. You can see at the, at the top of both of these pages, you have a reference to the calendar. This is because there are certain calendar pages uh, within the book, and in many instances, in, in all instances, they correspond with an astrological sign Okay, at the top of the page. Uh, stars were also very important um, and very much tied to agri the agricultural calendar. So many people at this time thought that was very important. So a book like this would also um, gain importance in that respect. Um, in addition to that, medical uh, practitioners who were living in this medi medieval period and the Renaissance period believed that people's health issues were directly related to the constellation of their birth month. So it's another reason why we see this emphasis on the astrological sign as part of the Book of the Hours. And lastly, even uh, the church calendar used the zodiac to calculate important feast days. So that's why we see um, the astrological signs and the zodiac um, signs signified here at the top of each page. But now let's take a look at the actual pages. So here's the January page. It depicts an, arist uh, an arist aristocratic household and barely hints at the harsh winter otherwise, which would have been outside. Remember, we're in Northern Europe, so we're even farther north than France and Germany, um, some parts of Germany. And so it's actually really cold up there, right, in the winter months. But here you actually have the Duke of Berry, who was the patron. He's represented right here. He's seated at the head of the table, um, and he was the one who commissioned this uh, book for his personal use. So, of course, um, this happens very often. We have him represented here as part of the, the festivities that are taking place. So this would have been a luxury item, and it would have attested to his wealth. Um, and his lavish lifestyle. So you can see all the people he surrounds him with, surrounds himself uh, with, are all also very lavishly dressed. You see a variety of men and women here. It's possible, um, people have speculated that this is actually a portrait of one of the artists, um, but it's um, not for sure. But here you see there's the exchanging of gifts amongst people. Uh, objects of wealth are exchanged and displayed on the table. And then in the background, we have a giant tapestry that is hung on the walls, almost making it look like this is an outdoor scene. But in fact, this is just a, a tapestry of knights going into battle. Okay, And in your chapter, there there is a, quite a few pages that um, specify an interest in tapestry at this time. And so tapestry was used not only to decorate walls, but also for a more practical reason, it was used to warm the space. So remember, many of these people lived in stone palaces, uh, and and stone is a pretty it's a pretty cold 
um, it's a pretty cold uh, wall to have around you. And so they would put these giant tapestries on the walls to try to insulate the space, especially in these cold winter months. And then on the other side of that, a couple months later, you see February. Again, we have the astrological signs at top, um, specific to February. We have peasants working in the fields and then coming in to warm themselves. Um, here you actually have nudity within the within the book as well, and this is more common than you'd think, uh, in, even within this religious context. Um, these men are so cold that they've, they've pulled up um, their garments so high, and they're trying to warm themselves by the fire, so they've pulled up their garments so high that you can actually see their nether regions um, here. And so that's actually very common that you'd have nudity. Um, in this context, it wasn't really seen as much of a big deal. Here you also have uh, very gothic conventions. Um, peasants are working in the fields, but then we have the cutaway view of the house, right? We know that this wouldn't actually be an open space, but that rather this is a cutaway vision of the house. So we have the one wall removed so that we can actually look inside and see the figures. Um, there's attention to detail, right? Especially these anecdotal details that aren't really that uh, specifically that important, but we have uh, people doing very specific things here. We have this very specific church, which was most likely an actual um, building that would have been on the Duke of Berry's uh, land. So he um, um, actually owned much of the land that, are, uh, that was represented in the book. And then we also have the high placement of the horizon line, and that's very common in Gothic convention as well. And so I think that that's where I wanted to stop today. Just wanted to take a look here um, at some manuscripts and a few of those kind of conventional paintings that come up in, in the chapter to really get a, a look at uh, Renaissance, uh, Northern Renaissance conventions and um, style and so forth. Um, have a good week. Let me know if you have questions about any of this material. There's a variety of videos posted for you to view as well before you take uh, part in the discussion in the quiz. I hope you all have a good week, and I'll talk to you next week.